Hello, everyone. My name is Darla Saunders, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Sylvain Chetra and Karel Joubert. Sylvain Chetra is a full professor in the Faculty of Forestry, Geography, and Geomatics at the University of Laval. He teaches several courses covering the concepts of hydrology applied to forest and wetlands. His areas of expertise are related to the effects of forest management on water, forest roads, the measurement of snow and boreal forest ecosystems, the hydrology of peatlands, as well as hydrographic mapping from LIDAR data. Karel Gilbert holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of Laval. She is currently pursuing her PhD in forest sciences in the hydrology lab at the University of Laval under Slovan supervision. Her thesis focuses on decommissioning methods for low volume roads and their impact on sediment inputs to streams. After this afternoon's presentation, or this morning's presentation rather, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. So I'll now turn the webinar over to Professor Jutra. Thank you, Darla. Yeah, so uh, I'll be presenting you some uh, issues and solution uh, to the question of uh, water and forest roads networks, especially for Quebec. Uh, but I intend to have a discussion with you on the, what's happening uh, elsewhere. So uh, first and foremost, I am a forest engineer and I play different roles. As you can see on the first slide, I'm part of two uh, center of research, one in forestry and one in hydrology. Normally, I play the role of the forest expert for hydrologists and I play the hydrology expert for foresters. And I'm, I'm quite good with that. It's a, it's a quite interesting situation where I'm um, among the too few forest hydrology specialists in Quebec, to my opinion, but yeah, that's it. Um, the last logo, CAPSA, it's a watershed organization. So you have to know that it, it's been 15 years now that I, I am a volunteer in a watershed organization in my region, close to Quebec City. Uh, and it biases strongly my view because I am strongly biased towards water. Uh, and that's the whole point of my presentation here. Um, you have also to know that I'm full uh, francophone, uh, so 99% uh, of the time I always speak French and uh, work in French with all of my students. So uh, if there is some strange translation errors in English, just don't be bothered by that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm uh, in a situation where uh, I, I don't often have the opportunity to speak in English, so that's it. Okay, so uh, water issues in forest environment can be um, resumed or condensed to just a few things. Uh, the main threat, because there is many threats, there is some more important and less important, but I think to my opinion that the main threat is the external sediment input to stream. What do I mean by this external sediment? It's that sediments that are in the soils, in the land, not around the stream. When you uh, make some forest management activities, and those activities uh, can be prone to erosion and favor erosion and bring sediments that normally would never have to go in a stream are flowing to a stream. That, that's a, a part of what we need to do or avoid uh, when making some forest management activities. Uh, because there is a lot of sediment transportation within streams and uh, riverine areas, but I exclude those types of sediment uh, in my presentation because normally in forestry, we don't play in these ecosystems. Um, so from uh, forest harvesting, there is risks to promote external sediment input to streams. Uh, erosion from damaged soil uh, is can be frequent and for that we have solution we are limiting rotting while uh, harvesting in forest areas uh, and the same is that when there is some rotting or erosion erosion in the fields then we uh, have solution to reduce the input to stream by uh, using riparian buffers uh, i'll show you uh, schematically what it looks like so 
when you have a forest and a river, uh, once you harvest, there is some risk because you, the forest management is done with heavy machinery. Uh, that rotting and compaction may occur in the area where forest is harvested. Those rottings, those cavities in the soils, uh, when uh, submitted to high precipitation or snow melt, for example, they can accumulate water and accelerate the flow of water uh, within those um, depressions. Uh, all this can generate augmented peak flows and erosion and external um, sediment input in streams. So one solution is to reduce rotting and compaction, most and for all. So it's it's one really good way to reduce that risk. And there's another way to reduce that is to use riparian buffers, which are a layer of wood where we have no machinery going through these areas. So the soil and the humus play the role of a filter. So if there is some sediment that comes from the harvested area and want to flow down up to the stream, then the sediments that will go through this riparian buffer might be sediment free. Uh, uh, so yeah, sediment free. What it looks like from above, uh, limiting rotting in Quebec's regulation, because we have on public land a really clear regulation on that. Uh, it is resumed really easily is that we need to have less than 25% of the total length of the trails in each wood cutting area that uh, is limited to uh, rutting. So for example, in this picture, if you have a cutting area in yellow, then in red would be, it's a, a gross approximation I did myself on a, pictures, uh, on a picture, but uh, the point is that in red would be rutted uh, length of trails and in blue uh, areas that are not uh, rutted. So in such situation, we calculate and limiting to 25% is quite complicated in some type of soils. And that's why we harvest during winter time to avoid these stuff and uh, these uh, damage to the soils. Um, the next very important way of doing is uh, to protect uh, aquatic ecosystem is to use riparian buffers. So uh, in Quebec, it's called wooded strips and it's a protection of the wooded strips. We have regulations since many, many years, decades, in fact, uh, and it's very strictly uh, applied since, yeah, decades in Quebec. So there's no heavy equipment within those, uh, stri uh, those strips and harvesting can be allowed or forbid forbidden depending on the width and the situation where the, uh, this, these buffers are located. So the permanent streams, uh, for example, here in the picture, uh, will, leave 20, will leave 20 meters on each side of the stream, the permanent stream. And for intermittent stream, it's a six meter wide buffer strips uh, where we can harvest all the wood, uh, mercant mercantile wood, but uh, we'll avoid uh, any passage of machinery. So on the perspective of water protection, yeah, that's good enough. So these way, these best management pra practices I just explained are widely applied in Quebec. There's, there's no excuse, there's, it's applied and it's good. So I think there's, the threat is, not very important from a forest harvesting perspective because we have good best management practices and we use them. Uh, coming back to the main threat, the external sediment input, input in, uh, to stream is also favored from the road networks because every single water crossing are points of contact with streams. Uh, so you have, for example, in this picture, uh, while constructing, very clear proper construction method that are available in the regulation uh, but you have to understand that there is tons and tons of sediments external sediments it's the material that makes the bridge the the, the not the bridge the the, the culvert and the, all the filling material is it is technically some external sediment that you put over a stream and you intend to keep it there so that's the whole point. While constructing that, in Quebec, we have really good uh, uh, regulation. The problem is that then 
once it's used, the forest roads can be ag ag aggravating factors because you need maintenance of those roads and the ditches that go uh, on the side of those roads and bring water up to the, the, the network, the, the stream networks. And all of this is well described in the regulation. Uh, in Quebec, as uh, in many other places uh, in Canada and uh, uh, Northeastern uh, North America, um, the forest road construction on public land, because we have in Quebec 80% of our forests area, forested area that is public land. So that it's a huge amount of our forest industry and wood that is harvested on public land. And we have a really strict regulation, uh, the RNI, I, I won't say it in, in English, there's no translation for it anyway. <laughs> so the RNI uh, has been applied for 30 years and since the last three years we have a new regulation, Règlement sur l'aménagement durable des forêts, which is uh, a renovated, uh, more precise, uh, but pretty much the same thing that it was uh, applied 30 years before. And it, it's here just a, a, a schematics of all the rules, the regulation, how we deviate water. And we have, it's figure 28 of, of, a, of a book, a, a guide. So we have many, many, many things to follow up and the regulation when we construct for roads on public land it is really clear and we know how to do it and we have a lot of guides a lot of regulation and we follow them um, the point where i want to bring you today is that maintenance is a huge issue in the regulation since three years we have now a specific article that say that, that is saying that if you use frequently a road, you have a responsibility to maintain it. But the maintenance is not well described. It's just making making it possible to for the water to flow. That's pretty much all it all there is. And it's only concerning a frequent frequent use of a road. The whole big problem is that roads without users, there is absolutely, absolutely no law or regulation or no plan or follow-up at the moment because weirdly the Ministry of Forests 30 years ago when first the, the first regulation was put into place uh, thought that uh, if, they were, if all uh, water crossings and roads are well built, then they will last forever, which is something you probably know, and I surely know, it's totally false. Uh, you need maintenance and you need replacement. But all of that was avoided in any regulation of any kind. So let me show you what it brings on a day-to-day -day perspective. If you have, for example, uh, a catastrophic rain event that uh, flushes a part of your road, okay, a road erosion like this one, if, if it, it's a road that you frequently use for wildlife purpose, uh, forest management, wh whichever, you will need to maintain this road and repair the damage. Okay, and That's fair enough, that's logical, because you have a frequent use and it's part of the regulation at the moment. This is an example of one thing we uh, comple completely, uh, completely randomly, we uh, fell on this old road that was built in the probably in the 50s and the 60s where it was most of uh, the road was not with uh, bringing material was uh, excavating material in in the close to a, a riverbed but the point is that 100 meters up there's a culvert that was not maintained that is now blocked and the stream just went on the easiest path and it was in the road so uh, Kathy is not really tall, she's only five foot tall, <laughs> but it's, it's still a huge amount of sediment. That is all of what you see though, the whole hole you can see there, it's eroded sediment that is now in the stream. And this is, since there's no user, for sure there's no users of that, that road, then there's no follow-up. No one knows it, no one repairs it, and it's out of any regulation in Quebec, even not the Ministry of Forests. On 
most uh, on regularly used roads, then when you have problems of flushing, for example, in the spring where you have too much water, the culvert is too small, there is some blockage by uh, the lack of maintenance of the ditch, for example, uh, upstream, then if you frequently use the roads, you have to maintain it. But you can also take the decision to say, mm, that road, I don't like it. I'm not using it, so I'm not repairing it. And no one in the government of Quebec will know it. So there's no follow-up of those situations, not at all. Um, what are the threats that are brought by the lack of maintenance? There's a definite and clear threat to a barrier to fish passage because many culverts were badly installed uh, with too, uh, too high uh, um, waterfalls or slopes that are uh, too, uh, too, too big. So in fact, the, the fish cannot go upstream. So we have lots of situation where fish, fish passage is um, uh, in fact uh, blocked. And these situations are not known by the Ministry of the For uh, Forest. And But if you have to change a culvert like this one, you'll have to uh, prepare it uh, to uh, maintain a proper fish passage. The problem is that if you don't repair the road, <laughs> that's not, not your problem. That's the problem of no one. Um, here you have a, another situation where the a culvert failure consequence, because once in a while, you'll have a situation where yeah, there will be a failure. There will be a, a, a washout. The, the stream will go completely over the culvert and uh, drain and evacuate all the sediment that is over the culvert. In such situation, if you're a user of the road, if you need it, yeah, you'll have to repair it. So you'll repair it following strict regulation. So after the situation, after the accident, uh, the damage in the environment, you'll have to follow up all the regulation and you'll have afterwards a really good and a properly installed culvert. The problem is that the existing damage in such situation, that's none of the business of anyone because there was no action. It's the same with the federal law. If you don't have, if you don't take action, then you are not responsible of what's happening. So it's kind of Mother Nature's fault, which I don't agree with, because Mother Nature didn't install this culprit. Um, so there's no regulation, no follow-up, and we'll just know that there was a new culvert, but we don't even know if there was a damage to the environment. Uh, another catastrophic example here on the Côte Nord region. In this situation, it took just a few a few weeks to repair uh, the situation. So uh, a new culvert was installed, new filling, everything was fine. But the the, the damage to the environment, it's tons and tons of sediments, big and fine sediments that were flushed directly in the ecosystem. And for this, there is the existing damage to the environment. There's no regulation, no follow-up, no nothing. So no one knows and no one is paying for the situation. So if there's no per, anyone in charge, then uh, there's no incentive to repair the situation before they happen. That's the whole point. Um, forest road network management in Quebec. So since forest roads are public, then maybe a little history of how much uh, roads were built in Quebec. Uh, the road network was mainly built for forest harvesting in our public land. Uh, it was a gradual increment from the 60s to the 80s for different reasons. Floating woods was still uh, available in the early 60s. And then slowly uh, the, the extension and the power of, uh, of sawmills to uh, treat and uh, transform more wood make it uh, easier to go uh, further up north and uh, cover uh, more uh, extent of, uh, yeah, of road and territory to harvest wood. So in the 90s up to the 2010, uh, you can see here on the, the figure, it's the evo evolution of the volume uh, harvested in public land. So you can see that from 1994 to 2006, 2007, we were always in Quebec harvesting more than 25 million cubic meter of wood annually. So during this whole period, the amount of road that we needed to build because this wood was harvested in 
pristine forest. There was no roads or no system to access those res forest resources. So huge amounts of uh, roads were built by the end of the 80s up to the early 20, 20, uh, 2000, sorry. Uh, and we had for all that, that period of time, a strict application of the regulation we had. So all normally, technically, all the streams and ro uh, sorry, roads and water crossings were built according to a good regulation. <clears throat> then after the harvesting, most of the time you some reach third, uh, in fact, the uh, low volume roads for extraction of wood were used for short periods of, periods of time. And then uh, since the uh, roads are owned by the Ministry of Forests and the, the government of Quebec, then uh, the use uh, the roads were used for other purposes, for example, for wildlife, hunting, fishing, uh, forest education, uh, uh, education of the forest, so silviculture, so uh, uh, plantation, uh, pre-commercial thinning, thinning, stuff like that. But in our extremely extended forests area, we normally just educate the, the, the forest. So we plant probably some thinning and then we don't go for 40, 50 years in the forest. So the length of the use of the road is really short um, for research also. So what is the current state of forests networks in Quebec? Here is a very strong statement here done by, uh, everything is in French, but I'll translate that to you. Uh, it's the first uh, Quebec's chief forester report on sustainable forest uh, management. Uh, we have a chief forester in Quebec since uh, early, uh, I think it was 2005 or something like that, or 2008. And in his first report, the forester in chief uh, said that old roads are without surveillance. So here's the translation. Forest companies are responsible of the maintenance of roads while they use them. As I told you, it's really clear in the regulation. There is no monitoring of roads after this intensive use period. Absence of monitoring, status report, or action plan for old roads and water crossing is a common thing in Quebec at the moment, in 2010, so 10 years ago. Furthermore, there is no assessment of the extent of the abandoned road network and its impact on sediment input to stream. So the whole problem, the whole situation I'm explaining to you is known since 30 years, but it was written 10 years ago. And since then, the two other reports of the chief forester in Quebec excluded, ex there is not a single line in the two uh, re more recent report concerning old roads in the report of the chief forester. So it was said, it was said once and it was forgotten afterwards. So knowing that, um, myself and students went on a project uh, with, file, uh, with a collaborative uh, partnership with the Wildlife Foundation in Quebec, outfitters and wildlife managers, because they, they have to promote the uh, a proper use of uh, the protection of streams because they are making money from fishing, uh, sport fishing. Uh, as much as uh, salmon is the same situation. So we worked on a, a perspective of measuring what's happening with the state and durability of water crossing, but we used not the roads as a, um, a way of measuring things, we used watershed. So we delineated at 13 watershed in six different landscape units. You can see the stars throughout the Quebec province. And we made an exhaustive inventory of all roads, all water crossing in those watersheds. First result is that the provincial database of the road, the, of the roads, forest roads are incomplete. Uh, from the fourth national inventory, which is the most recent one, we just said, oh, maybe we should find, look at if everything is fine previously. So we find uh, we found this uh, strong. Quite surprising thing, the third national inventory has much. Uh, in fact, there was more roads in the third forest inventory for many region 
than in the fort. So what happened is that many roads disappeared because they were closed, they were, they were abandoned, not accessible anymore. So for um, access to the resources, on, on the perspective of, of access to the resources, uh, many roads were just deleted from the database without any closure whatsoever. It's just deleted from a database. So from the most recent database, we just found out that, that there's more than 300,000 kilometers of roads from which we had to add 4% of new roads, 18% of roads that were er erased from previous database, and 13% of roads that were never digitized. So we have more than 400,000 kilometers of road, and we don't even have a good mapping of them at the moment. Over 500 kilometers of roads were studied, uh, and once extrapolated on the landscape unit, we found that found out that uh, on the right side, we had 37 percent of all roads in the watershed that were abandoned. Abandoned means there is trees growing directly in the middle of the road. They are not accessible to any type of transportation. They are, they are not any more roads, but the filling is still there. And from all of those abandoned roads, none were closed properly. So closed meaning decommissioning or taking away the, the, the culverts, nothing was done at, at that point. And the low use of the road was over 34%, making it the, in, in the regulation when we have an intensive road use, it's only 29% of the stream uh, of the, the, the network. And most of all, we just realized what the partners were saying there's 79% of the roads that we studied that had no maintenance whatsoever on any of the component components of the road including the, uh, um, the water crossings. So uh, now we have the water cross, uh, we also studied the water crossings and uh, we extrapolate that on the six uh, landscape units showing that at the moment there was 31% of the road, of the water crossings that were non-functional. So they don't they're not even there anymore. It's, it's impossible to cross them with any vehicle. There is some damage to the environment for 31% of all the, the, water, the, the, the water crossing we had. And 64% are seriously deteriorated and there is no plan to replace them. And they are most especially often in roads that we cannot even access anymore. So that's the state of the situation right now on public forests in Quebec. Um, and we also measured, and it's nothing new, anyone installing metal culverts know it, uh, also, uh, especially since they are all carbonized and the cheapest you can find, because in Quebec, we, there's no mean we should install uh, aluminized uh, metal culverts, but makes no sense, it's not our roads. So um, technically, metal culverts never last more than 30 years. And as I told you, there is a huge amount of roads that have been built in the 1990s. So the problem is already there, but it's going to be an even more problem in the uh, more important problem in the future years. So the lack of maintenance of road networks at the moment, it's a direct threat to water quality. There's no doubt about that. Uh, there is an inevitable aging of water crossing, but it's at the moment not something um, uh, accepted by the Minister of Forests officially. But there is some good news. Uh, Quebec's sustainable forest management strategy, product, product uh, it was uh, published in two, uh, 2015, um, there is a, a chunk, a part, saying that to achieve a, pro a good protection of aquatic ecosystem, there's three points. New requirements of the regulation, that's good, that's done, it's in the regulation, but as I, I, as I told you, the regulation at the moment is really good, but it only concerns new roads, new constructions, and if you have a, a frequent, you, frequent use of a road, then you have a responsibility. It's avoiding completely 
uh, low use roads. Uh, there is also a point concerning equivalent cutting area for salmon rivers, which is already applied since many years. Uh, and then a third point, forest road network management policy. Ah, that's really interesting because that's something we should do. The point is that we have absolutely no clue at the moment who is working on that, what is the delay, it, will it concern everything we need to know, is it exhaustive, we have absolutely no news about that. So from my expertise point of view, I have to say, to make this statement right now in front of you, in 2021, today, there is still no monitoring of old forest roads and water crossing by the Ministry of Forest in Quebec, nor the adoption of a road ma uh, management policy at the moment. We have neither of those. But there is some solution, and the solution comes from partly high resolution mapping of streams and roads. Um, there is in Quebec uh, new ma uh, many new mapping products that are available. Uh, the Ministry of Forests, uh, they invested to acquire the whole province, the southern part of the whole province in LIDAR. So at the moment, we already have publicly available more than 300,000 square kilometers of digital elevation model derived from LIDAR on a one by one meter resolution. It is extraordinary. And since the last four years, I've been working with the Ministry of Forests of Quebec to uh, adjust, analyze, and produce. Uh, they are the one who produce the data, but I, I've been doing research with them for, since the last four years, and the Ministry of Environment also. Um, and now they published the potential stream beds, which you see in blue, and the topographic wetness index for this whole coverage uh, of the province. Uh, it's also free to download on Denis Québec and you can display it live on uh, our library, uh, digital library at the Université Laval. Uh, the sad thing, but it's a good news at the same time, the Gaspésia Peninsula will be published maybe in three, mo three months from now, so it's, it's uh, supposed to be published in April 2021. Uh, so the region where a lot of salmon fisheries uh, are uh, done uh, in the Appalachian, uh, the mapping will be avail available in a couple of uh, weeks, uh, three months from now. Um, but there's more to do with uh, digital elevation model that are derived from LIDAR data. And I hear say that we need to go beyond foot uh, aerial picture in interpretation for the pieces of land. That's what we did for decades. But now the technology, we need to think of something else because LiDAR sees through the canopy. So the digital elevation model is something uh, of a precision we never had before. So we have to geo-interpret these digital elevation model, and I'll show you how we did it, at least for uh, a chunk of land in uh, close to Quebec City, uh, where uh, we have a uh, forest, uh, Forêt Montmorency, which is a forest uh, we uh, have the uh, we manage uh, at the university. For example, here you can see a uh, aerial picture of uh, forest environment. You can easily see that there's road and streams. Okay, so here are the roads mapped in the Fort National Inventory. And here are the hydrological components, lakes and streams from the, the same inventory. But when you put on the digital elevation model uh, with uh, shading, you realize that all of the, the roads are not exactly on the roads. They are a couple of meters aside. So why not delete the roads? And as you can see, you, you still see the roads very easily. They are easy to find. So why not geo-interpret them? So we just digitize on the digi digital elevation model the, of the LIDAR, uh, thousands of uh, kilometers of road. So now we know exactly where they are. And we found that many roads were missing. And we can even see roads that are under closed canopy and abandoned roads. That's the whole point of doing that. And then when we replace the hydrological network that was 
not very precise by something much more precise derived from LIDAR. We have much more information and most especially we can deduce where are culverts. So at the moment with just a, the help of a few students, uh, a couple of months of work, then we have a new map of streams, new maps of roads, and new maps of potential location of culverts, which is extremely useful. And there's absolutely nothing uh, stopping the government of Quebec of doing that for its old territory in the coming, coming months. There's it's just, it's just a, the, the data is there. There's, there's no excuse now. So what will we do with this information? Um, I think we should go beyond just observing where is the, uh, is the situation, where are the roads and the, the culverts. We need to evaluate, extract these information by watershed because it's, I think it would be a very efficient use of the concept of watershed management. So you have, you know, there's a, a stream or a specific spot in a stream where it's really important for the reprodu reproduction of certain types of fish. Uh, then in such situation, we normally uh, limit the interpretation of what's happening in the watershed with the ECA, so the equivalent clear-cut area calculation on that watershed. But to me, it's not important. It's much, much more important to have a very precise road density in that watershed. Uh, what are the roads? High ro uh, large road, uh, small roads, unknown, abandoned. Uh, what's the states of the road? What are, uh, are the states of the, of the ditch? Uh, what is the use and the maintenance frequency on those roads? How many water crossings? What are their, their states? What are the maintenance needs? Uh, does these water crossing uh, enable fish, fish passage or not? Because all of those details won't be shown by equivalent clear-cut area. Uh, but if we manage by watershed, then these situation and these evaluation of the threats to the external input of sediment in stream might be much more efficient to have a good maintenance and good objective of protection for aquatic ecosystems. So uh, there's a way of calculating all that with the cumulative effect assess assessment uh, project. I know of one in British Columbia, there's probably other areas uh, in the world where there is a good cumulative uh, effect assessment uh, that can be done for those roads and water crossing on a watershed perspective. So that's an easy solution coming from a good mapping of those infrastructures. But the very most important solution for road maintenance, uh, uh, for roads in Quebec, and it's something needed. It's something that the government told us that they wanted to do that, but it's been five years and six years, and we had never had a, a single communication uh, about that. Uh, we need, and I added this: the Ministry of Forest needs. Uh, they said that that they will do a road network management policy but they didn't say it if it will be integrated and exhaustive because technically it might be only a road network, let's say road access management policy. So it, it, it could be only oriented toward how can we reach the wood in uh, the, the wood, the, um, the volume of wood in the forests uh, to have something uh, the most valuable possible, but it might not even consider the protection of, of water ecosystems. So to me, I think that the Ministry of Forest in Quebec has to take the responsibility of the protection of water in public forests, which the ministry does only partly, to my opinion. Uh, the governmental database of road, road network needs to be uh, implemented. We need to have every road delineated using LIDAR, even the abandoned roads. We also need every water crossing. We can extrapolate where they are and later we need to have their states and expiry dates. So we need to know what type of maintenance will be needed. And if there is some maintenance, no, we don't have to 
wait until they're flushed to settle the problem because that's normally the best solution at the moment is to say uh, let's wait let's wait until they they flush away and then we won't have any problem anymore but on a protection of the streams and the aquatic environment perspective it doesn't make sense um, we need also to develop within this uh, the policy new low volume road management methods because we don't have a lot available in our toolbox in Quebec Technically, uh, there is a lack of precise requirement for maintenance. We don't even have a part of the guide on public land and how we build and maintain our roads. There's nothing concerning maintenance. There's no guidance. There's nothing. So it said you need to maintain it, but we don't know how, and we don't know. We don't want to know it. How you do it? That's also the, the thing. Um, we need to permit decommissioning because we need to be frank and honest here. There is so much low volume roads in Quebec that there's no way we can repair all of those water crossings with new water crossings that will need maintenance. So we need to think of decommissioning and using temporary bridge for temporary reuse and probably also improve rock forts. And I'll show you the results of some research I'm doing uh, concerning that. And we need to facilitate and finance road closure because even though we have roads, it's as weird as it looks, you cannot close, if, you, if you're a wildlife manager and realize that there's a problem with, with a road that is abandoned, completely impossible to go, but there's a few culverts that are haven't been in, uh, uninstalled and they are um, threatening the quality of your habitat uh, of interest, then you cannot call the Ministry of Forests and saying, hey, that's your road, close it. If you do that, you know what the, the Ministry of Forests will do? They will say, okay, pay for it. So the wildlife manager has to pay to decommission or close a road. It doesn't make sense because it's public land, it's public road. It's not their road uh, of the wildlife uh, managers doesn't make sense and it's, it's that's why i say we need to facilitate and finance road closure uh, except uh, outside the the, the caribou uh, thing because we're closing road in the caribou uh, problematic region but uh, that's not the same uh, issue so um we need to use more open bottom arch culvert to my opinion it's a really good durable situation it's not a magic, uh, a magic type of water crossing. It's hard to install and it, it's complicated, but it needs, uh, it has a longer uh, life expectancy. Uh, it might be very interesting for fish, fish passage on a long-term perspective, but in Quebec, it is, it is still greatly unpopular for many weird reason, for example, for uh, uh, related to the regulation that is needed uh, to install those. Um, temporary bridge in Quebec are very, very unpopular, but they are tending to become more popular. The point is that nowadays, if you want to use a temporary bridge, you have to close your road after three years, which doesn't make sense because you'll have to educate your forest afterwards. So very few people are using them because it's not possible to just take away the bridge and continue crossing the river. Uh, so, and that's why where the solution of improved rock fords might be interesting, but it's specific to low volume roads and in specific areas of small streams. Here I show you an example on the uh, Côte Nord region, a project where I have a lot of partners such as Hydro-Québec and the Minister of Forests, because the Minister of Forests in these situations are really prone to help research and develop new solutions. Um, so before you can see this, there has been many washouts. There's, you see the latest one, but there is so many culverts in place that we, it, for sure there has been more than one washout at, at this area. And we've replaced that by uh, a Ford that you see on the site. Uh, this was, um, in fact, we measured, and it's Karel Gilbert, uh, which is uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, here uh, today was also uh, who measured the amount of sediments that 
went out and she extracted only the fine sediment from the whole volume of roads that was uh, f uh, flushed by the washout. And it's almost 200 tons of fine sediments, not the whole thing, because it's much more than that. Uh, but only the fine sediments below two millimeters represents 17 dump trucks. Okay, think of it, 17 dump trucks of fine sediment, only fine sediment, dumped in the stream during one washout, and there's more than one. We know we replace that by a situation, a Ford, an improved rock Ford. It's it was impossible because we had to take away a beaver dam and stuff like that. So we had to work on the on the soil and the whole process of replacing this washout, this problematic site with a Ford generated technically a fully, fully loaded wheelbarrow of sediment. It's not perfect, but it's much less. And in the future, there's no threat. There's if the water is uh, upslope on each side of the road is diverted uh, efficiently, there is very few sediment that will reach the, the stream. And this is what it looks like. I I always show this video because it's for many people, they say, yeah, but there's sediment on the roads. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, it's a handful of sediments. And we are replacing the situation of lack of maintenance on low volume roads the threat is 17 dump trucks or a couple of handful of sediment every time you cross the stream. So think about it. The perspective to me is it's a win situation where you're replacing a low volume road with an improved rock fort. But it's not perfect. I'm I know, but it's it's a solution we have to think of. And to go beyond this whole point of uh, aquatic ecosystem, we even we are even, um, uh, I have colleagues in that project from the INRS in Quebec City, uh, Normand Bergeron, Elsa Gurig, and Audrey-Anne Grenier, who are working on the behavior of trout and salmon in a river. It's not the same as St. Marguerite River, where they installed pit tags and they uh, simulated uh, four wheelers. Um, uh, crossing a ford uh, and on the behavior on uh, of the, the the fish so we'll have results of that in a year or two from now and it's uh, very promising to sh sh show what's the impact of all that so here's my conclusion um water and forest road in quebec there's a main issue known everywhere it's good not only for quebec it's for everywhere i think that forest hydrology we need to reduce by any means possible the external sediment input to streams. With the use of best management practicing when we are harvesting forests, I think we are having an effective perfect, uh, protection of water and aquatic ecosystem. It's not perfect, but it's, it's good enough on, on that aspect. Um, the construction of road is well regulated but the lack of maintenance of road network it's a considerable considerable threat to water quality even much more important than the best management practices default that we might have once in a while so the solution to me is we immediately have to have an integrated and exhaustive management policy of road networks and this would be based will be based and should be based on lidar derived mapping of road as, roads and water crossing and new road management methods are needed also to develop for uh, yeah low maintenance roads so that's it that was my presentation hope you liked it <laughs> and you have uh, some questions now Sylvain, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. It's such an important topic and um, you provided so much, so much great information on your research. Thank you. It's my pleasure.
So we'll now open up the question and answer session. So if folks have a couple of options. You can uh, raise your hand, figuratively speaking, uh, if you click on the hand icon and I will unmute your microphone so you can ask your question directly. Or you also have the option of typing in your question uh, under the question portion of the panel. Puis uh, aussi, vous avez la possibilité de poser vos questions en français, si vous voulez. Um, so we've already got our first question from Evangelos uh, Dadiotis. Uh, you mentioned that metal culverts last less than 30 years. Does this include open bottom culverts that span the bankful width of the channel and allow water and substrates to move through the culvert naturally? Uh, it's a very good question. From what I've read, I think they can last more than 25 years, but uh, I, we haven't measured any. So in the 300, well, almost 400 culverts we've measured, there was no open bottom culverts. So we have no data on that. Uh, I Normally, the, the point is that the, uh, when it's it depends on how it's built. So if the metal goes be, uh, below the um, low flow of the water, the low flow line of the water, then uh, they can rust. And if you lose the bottom of your arch uh, to rust, then you'll have a failure of your whole system. So thinking of a, a nice way to put uh, the middle part of your open all uh, open bottom culverts uh, higher than the low flow is a good idea, but it's not technically possible all the time. And sometimes it, it's it's having the effect of enlarging the width of your uh, infrastructures. So it it can be very expensive, but probably worth it. Um, when I discuss with uh, people from uh, New Brunswick who install such uh, of those structure, what they like compared to uh, bridges is that open bottom, open bottom culverts can be quite large, quite big, and they are seamless for transport. So they can be large enough and uh, in fact uh, uh, rapid enough to have the transportation of wood not having to reduce their speed before going on a bridge and then accelerating afterwards. So the, this fact uh, brings a lot of advantage on the uh, dynamic and the rapidity of wood transportation, which means cash. So uh, it's, it's a give and take, but the duration of the metal in normal uh, waters uh, from the uh, uh, boreal shield, for example, that's where mostly, especially where we, we've worked, uh, can rust uh, quite easily after 25 years, 30 years, it's uh, full of holes and structurally it, it won't maintain the, its force. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Carolyn Gillis. Um, Caroline, can you ask? Hello. Yes, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Sylvain, pour ta présentation. Euh, dans le contexte du bassin versant de la Restigouche, euh, nous, au Nouveau-Brunswick, on, on a fait un... On a utilisé les données LIDAR pour identifier des, des fragmentations pour le passage du poisson, euh, puisque les données sont disponibles depuis 2017. Donc, on a fait l'exercice ici. Puis on a mauditement hâte que... Euh, des données soient disponibles en Gaspésie pour pouvoir faire en tout euh, les, les, le bassin versant. Euh, je voulais savoir, au niveau des produits qui sont disponibles, parce qu'ils ne sont pas encore disponibles pour la Gaspésie, au niveau du MFFP, est-ce que euh, les données routières, comme que tu as présentées, sont disponibles en produits dès avril ou il faut le faire nous-mêmes? Non. Euh, I'll... I'll repeat your, your question in English just uh, for the benefit of uh, our listeners in English. Uh, the, the question was, is there in the upcoming uh, diffusion, of, not diffusion, but publishments of the, the, the LIDAR derived uh, sub products? Um, at the moment, what the Minister of Forests for the Gaspesia region will publish will only include uh, the stream beds and the, um, uh, the topographic wetness index. 
at the moment we are working uh, in fact in two months from now <laughs> we're in february so by the end of march we have a report of our second two-year project to uh, deposit at the ministry of forest and the two new tools uh, we produced is a tool for delineation of the uh, ecotone uh, so the riverine ecotone buffer strip so how width is the ecotone uh, and we also we have um, another uh, the other one is an uh, uncertainty of the positioning and the uncertainty of the um, threshold for the delineation of streams so streams we could we will add uh, uncertainty so we'll be able to say we there's there's a, a line here delineating a possible stream but we are confident it's there or not confident it's there so this is something we'll add and nothing at the moment is done on the side of the Ministry of Forests concerning uh, roads and um, culvert mappings. What we know is the Ministry of, not the Ministry of Forests, but the Ministry of uh, Energy and Natural Resources that are having one person compiling the available information on the positioning of streams from the industries and uh, wildlife uh, organization and they are pooling these information into a database it would be it will be extremely far from exhaustive that's one point but it's a, a good start because having these information can enable us to have much better uh, delineation of where streams are because uh, that's a point I didn't uh, show you, but there's a lot of deviation of stream uh, in the LIDAR modeling of where are the streams. That comes from the fact that we don't know where the roads, uh, we don't see the culverts on, uh, underneath the roads, so we have to burn them efficiently to be able to have a good delineation of where the streams are flowing. But all this is a, it's an iterative work, so more and more the government of, of Quebec will know where are the culverts, but at the moment it's not intended to be exhaustive. And the roads, uh, a mapping of roads, it's still something I don't have any knowledge of precise work from the Minister of Forest. There's probably people working on that, but uh, no one has reached me to have any uh, expertise. Okay, thank you so much, Sylvain. It, it really helps to know uh, what the status, statuses of, of those yes. products and, and how us at the local scale, we can alleviate that gap more rapidly, possibly with local partners. Oh. And hopefully we'll touch base uh, very soon on that. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ed Torin Leet. Uh, what criteria do you use for low volume road traffic? Oh, that's a really good question. We, Karel, uh, my PhD student working on that, she has been through a lot of readings and we haven't found any consistent or uh, yeah, science-based evaluation of what's a low volume road. And the point is that once you think that a road is a low volume road in a forest environment, if you repair it and decommission it, then it might not be anymore a low volume road because it will be newly accessible. So that's, that's a strange situation where we need to, in fact, what I, I think is that the improve Fords, we are wanting to develop a little bit more as a solution to decommissioning some low volume roads. You need to understand that it's impossible to go through such infrastructure with a fully loaded truck uh, of wood uh, on these infrastructure. In a low bed cannot go through that because of the, the structure. So it's not a matter of um, pressure, but it's low. Uh, um, I think there can be a lot of traffic from small vehicle. That's how I intend it. So the, the low volume means low frequency and also to, on my perspective, is also um, a low, uh, low pressure or 
small size vehicle, light vehicle compared to long and heavy transportation vehicle because vans will just get stuck, a low bed will just get stuck in this area. Um, but when we think of forest management and forest education, after a harvesting period where the wood can be extracted through a temporary bridge, then after the extraction of woods and the machinery is out of the, of the harvested patch, then the ford can be used for plantation, uh, pre-commercial thinning, education of the, of the, uh, of the forest end, and then in maybe 40, 50 years, then you have ex no risk of any washout whatsoever. And in 50, 60 years, if you want to come back for a, a thinning, for example, then you, you still use the spot where you used your temporary bridge, put a temporary bridge once again, and then access to your land. That's, so that, that's, to me, it's kind of a way of using a decommissioning with, uh, with a method that could be uh, very uh, uh, useful. So using temporary bridge and uh, um, forwards at the same time, next and uh, technically next one to the other, not one uh, under the uh, the other. It's something we are thinking about, and we will be developing uh, such types of structure in Gaspesia in the this summer uh, 2000, uh, 2021. That's our intent at the moment. We have a finance project with Temrex, in fact. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Olivier Morissette. Uh, with forestry operations come other stakeholders, such as hunters, anglers, who construct cabins and form associations and are more likely to stay there longer, have less funds than forestry companies, hence less capacity to manage roads. There's certainly a challenge on who pays uh, for how many and who pays. Do you have any views on this? The situation is known since decades now this situation is not new the the point is that now the 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 main the lack of maintenance is just so overwhelming because of the age of the structure that are reaching their final life duration it's it's just it will explode this whole situation and there is no way we can pass this this user payer thing concept doesn't work it it works with with forest industries in highly used roads, but it's it's not a way to manage old roads. And for example, we could close or uh, many, many roads because uh, wildlife uh, hunters and anglers and, and all of these, they don't use all the roads. They, they know it. Uh, the, they, they even map their own territory. They know where the roads are, but they don't tell the Ministry of Forest. That's the whole point also. <laughs> that, that's a confrontation that, that, that is uh, easy to understand too. But the point is that um, they, are, they, they don't have use for all the roads. They probably wish to close a lot of these roads and decommissioning for them would be perfect. With the four wheelers going through a, a, an improved rock ford could be a much better solution than going over a culvert during decades and once it's flush then you go through it uh, without any proper stabilization with pieces of wood and that's where what is done everywhere so this lack of maintenance and a follow-up by the Ministry of Forest it's it's a threat to ecosystem and it doesn't Re reduce or improve the use of the land by others users, uh, for example, for the wildlife, for, from a wildlife perspective uh, so the situation. So they, there's no solution. There's just, there, there's, there's one solution. It, it, we need a policy that's, co that's covering every single road in public land. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Wafa. Shuaib, uh, do you have any idea whether the sediment load increasing as a result of lack of maintenance would affect the water temperature in rivers beside affecting the fist passage? That is a good question. Uh, I, mm, I don't know. I don't think it will have a, a great effect on uh, temperature. It, it might no, no, because there's no 
more exposure to light uh, following a washout, for example, or the, ex the input of a lot of fine sediment. Uh, and the, the fine sediment are in the riverbed and in the stream, in the water, for a very short period of time until they are deposited. So uh, the effect on temperature might be very, very temporary for a couple of days, uh, hours, days, something like that. But it's the uh, the threat to the uh, the water dynamic that goes in the reproductive ecosystem that is a much more important threat to me from my perspective. But I don't have a, a, an exact answer for the water temperature, but I, I, I suspect that there is no um, large and measurable and significant increase in water temperature following uh, input of uh, sediments and streams. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Karen Beasley, who asks, do you know which jurisdiction has the best or a good example of a forest road network management plan and database? Uh, I wish so much, so much to know that. I have no idea. I, You know how long it took me to make this presentation? I've been in the forests. Uh, uh, I, I'm a forest engineer since 20 years. And it might be in the last five years that I realized the holes, the, the empty spots in the regulation. It takes years to understand that we're doing something wrong because I was trained the, thinking that everything was fine. And it's by experience, by discussion, by reading the regulation that I realized there's something missing because the regulation and the law are all perfect. They're good. We cannot complain about that. But that's what's not in the regulation that is making the, mo the most damage. And going through these amount of details takes years and I have no idea where these things are better uh, maintained. I know that in New Brunswick, uh, on public land, uh, I recently discussed with someone from Irving who told me that they have a, a, a way of uh, maintaining their road built on the outcome-based forestry, which is not the case in Quebec. It's totally not that. <laughs> We, we, the outcomes, we don't need the, to know the outcomes of our forestry. We just need to follow the regulation. That's period. That's all the, it's the way it's done. And in, this, in such situation, I think that in New Brunswick, they have a good way of doing that. That's what I heard, but I have no proof. I have no document because everything needs to be discussed. That's the whole problem of this situation. Uh, I don't know any good literature review, but if you know, just send them to me because I'm very interested to know if there's a place where it's better managed and maintained. Um, technically, it should come from auditors. So it, it should come from a certification organization that would say, hey, concerning the water, there's something to do. You need to know where are your uh, old net road networks. The point is that most certification uh, structures are certifying what's happening in the forest industry. So if the forest industry follows the rules and don't uh, maintain the, the roads, it's not an issue of the industry because it's the government that didn't ask to maintain the roads. So it's outside the jurisdiction of the company, which makes it logical on the certification perspective because the fault is on a governmental states. So who's, gov uh, who's uh, complaining or having uh, leverage on the government if the government doesn't act uh, accordingly on that situation? So I, I don't have any clues. But the, this whole question is really good. I, I wish I know some places where it's better done in North America. Thank you. Uh, our final question comes from Kirk McDonald, uh, who asks, what are the suggested key criteria for assessing water course crossing structural condition? I'm not sure I understand the, uh, precisely the question. 
Um, so I think he's looking for um, when you're assessing water crossings, say culverts or other crossings, how do you determine whether or not they're problematic? Okay. Um, first, there's the roads. Uh, the ditch, the road, the slope, does the road itself is eroding towards the uh, the um, the sensible spots of where the culvert is, uh, because there's a lot of uh, possible erosion coming from the road itself. And then the structure of the uh, the metal and um, abutment, uh, I don't, I think it's the good term, abutment on the side of, of the, the culvert that retain the material from falling from in the river. Uh, is the size good? Uh, is the metal rusted? And Technically, I haven't found yet uh, because those types of information are generally not scientifically based. They are mostly based on observation. So what's the amount of rust that you can um, tolerate before you need to change a structure? Normally, these types of information comes from the Ministry of Transportation for on the highways, for example. And they are using less and less metal because it's not durable. They are using uh, concrete and other types of structures now. So this is kind of a weird science where I don't know what to find, where to find the information. And it's probably existing, existing but at the same time, who will measure that? <laughs> We don't even know where the culverts are. So uh, the first step is to go to the culvert saying, oh, it's fully rusted. So at what point we say it's it's rusted enough and we need to change it. Normally in forestry, it's sad to say, but they replace it when it's breaking. So that it's broken. So it's, it's technical. It's uh, why fix it if it ain't broken. But this rule is beyond is irresponsibility it's it doesn't make sense on an aquatic perspective and that's why i'm my 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 what i'm telling you today is very um, uh, severe but at the moment i'm writing a letter to the ministry of forest because i need to go we need as a society to go beyond this discussion we need to find solution and put some solution and i think the minister of forest is well intended uh, and this uh, this situation should change or might change rapidly i hope so uh, and and it's it, it, else it doesn't make sense on a water perspective and since water is such a, a, a precious resource it's un, impossible not to act Toward its brushhead protection. It's just not politically valuable. Thank you so much. And thank you for this excellent presentation. It was uh, it was fantastic today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much.